Welcome back to Study Through the Bible, the YouTube channel where we study the Bible in community here on YouTube, and we do that in three simple steps. The first is through um, the daily assignments. If you check the description down below, it helps you to each day get into the Bible for yourself and understand what you're reading. Step two is these weekly videos where I share my insights and comments into the passages we've been studying the previous week. And step three, where you share your insights and comments and questions in the comments or uh, in the comments down below. And so I will be checking back to see what you all have to say. If um, all of that sounds good to you, click that subscribe button and enable notifications so you don't miss any future content as we work our way through the Bible. And of course, feel free to go back through all of our playlists, starting back with Genesis, Exodus, all the way back to where we are in our study of First and Second Kings and Second Chronicles as they kind of coincide with one another. Today, we're going to be in chapters 4 and 5 of Second Chronicles and First Kings chapter 8, and we are going to be getting some uh, unique glimpse into the person of Solomon and a bit of his ministry. We don't necessarily think of Solomon as um, a pastor or worship leader, but that's exactly uh, what he is doing uh, as we get into the completion of the temple, the inauguration of the temple, and Solomon's prayer as they are inaugurating the temple. We get some powerful lessons when it has to do with worship, and uh, I called it Lessons in Worship from the Son of David, um, because usually when we think of the Son of David, we think of Jesus. Um, Solomon literally was the Son of David, and so um, he is prophetic in that sense of Jesus, but also uh, he has a lot of wisdom. He was the wisest man on the face of the earth, except for Jesus himself. And so, and he is the one who erected the temple in which Jesus said, one greater than the temple is here. So let's go ahead and dive in today. And so we start out in 2 Chronicles 5, 3. And all the Israelites came together to the king at the time of the festival in the seventh month. And so uh, what feast do you think that they're celebrating? If you go back to Exodus and Leviticus, you remember our studies on the seven feasts of Israel. These were feasts that weren't human-made. It's not like Hallmark, you know, holidays. It's where, where God put these seven days on every Israelite's calendar, and they were commemorating the past, celebrating the present, and then they were all prophetic looking forward to the future. And so, <clears throat> It happens that the feast that they were celebrating or, and I think this was strategic on Solomon's part, I think as he thought through when should, when would be appropriate for us to actually put, uh, you know, the temple in motion and have it actually functional, that he thought through strategically on the calendar and came upon the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles was in the past commemorating the time where they were in the wilderness and God provided for their needs and they would live basically in tents. <clears throat> and so God says, I want you to remember this time by actually, you know, erecting tents and, you know, and dwelling in them uh, during this time. And you're going to eat certain foods and all this kind of stuff. And Solomon says, perfect. This is already on our calendar as a people. It's an important day. People are already setting it aside and we're going to use the past to celebrate the present. And you know what we, we do that in the, the church today through communion. Okay. Taking the Lord's Supper. And Jesus said, you know, he took Passover and then he celebrated it with his disciples. And he said, this is the new covenant of my blood, which shall be shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And I want you to do this and continue doing this until I return in the future. Okay, so past, present, future. We remember the past, celebrate the present, and then we look forward to what God's going to do in the future. And you may think of other things that are in your life, and they may be like <clears throat> cultural holidays, they may be family traditions, or they may even just be personal rituals that at certain times of the year, very important events in your life, important days on your calendar, that you take time to celebrate the present by remembering the past. 
And so that's exactly what Solomon does. And so as we're talking about worship, that in a sense is what worship is. It is anywhere we are, anything we're doing, we are celebrating God and we are remembering and taking time out of our schedule to remember everything that he's done, all the lessons that he has to teach us and all of the all of the miracles that he has done and the powerful things in our life. And so that's what Solomon is doing. So Second Chronicles 5.13, the trumpeters and musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, the singers raise their voices in praise to the Lord and sing, He is good. His love endures forever. Uh, surprise, you know, Chris Tomlin didn't write that one. Um, <laughs> David and uh, David and Solomon uh, wrote most of uh, the lyrics that we kind of borrow from in our modern worship songs. Uh, then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud. 1 Kings 8.54, when Solomon had finished all these prayers and supplications to the Lord, he rose from before the altar of the Lord, where he had been kneeling with his hands spread out toward heaven. And so we got two different things going on here. When I when we're talking about worship, and I say it's not about how, I'm referring to, you know, different churches worship different ways. If you go to a Sunday worship service, or they might have Saturday worship service, you know, it's not about the how that they worship. It's who they are worshiping. And that, that is the important thing. Now, you, that I want to place a caveat here that, you know, you don't want to give like free reign that, you know, every anything goes because there are a lot of things that are a, a lot of Christian churches are doing in the name of Jesus that are coming straight out of paganism, straight out of witchcraft, straight out of the occult, straight out of other religions and other cultural types of things. Okay. But what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the way that we worship. Okay, like what kind of songs do you sing? What kind of instruments do you play? Well, you know, do you allow dance? Do you allow for creative creativity? Do you allow for, you know, drama? Do you allow in, in teaching styles? Is there a particular way that you want the, the pastor to teach? Or um, is there a certain Bible translation that everyone's expected to read out of? You know, those kind of things don't ultimately matter okay it's very clear you know i find it interesting even when it comes to the conversation about instrumentation that there was a group of churches in american history called the restoration movement and they sought to just go to the bible like you know, if they didn't find something in the bible then they didn't do it and so this is like churches of christ christian church disciples of christ and there's there's a lot of others um who are within the bounds of christianity and outside the bounds of christianity but still call themselves christian um that are a part of that whole movement okay now what i find odd is that they, in doing that, they went just to the New Testament. And if they didn't find something in the New Testament, then they didn't even bother like examining contextually whether an Old Testament passage might be practical in terms of having an implication on the New Testament church. And one of those areas was in the, in the deal of instrumentation. And so you might know that there's an instrumental Church of Christ and a non-instrumental Church of Christ. And so the non-instrumental group, it's funny because even in those groups, I've been to some of the church services, and as long as it's special music or like a solo, then they allow people to like play instruments. It's kind of funny how they have these loopholes and technicalities um, whenever there's legalism around. But... Uh, that, you know, just making a big deal out of those kind of things is really petty. It's really like legalistic. It's missing the whole point of why why we're there, why we're gathered to, together there. And then the second thing, um, when, you know, Solomon, uh, it says, when he finished all these prayers and supplications to the Lord, he rose from before the altar of the Lord where he had been kneeling with his hands spread out toward heaven. Okay, And so when you think about prayer, when you think about worship, what kind of posture do you, do you find yourself thinking about? Do you think about somebody kneeling? Do you think about somebody sitting with their, their arms, you know, folded, head bowed, you know, reverent? Uh, do you think of silence? Do you think a lot of a, no a lot of noise? Do you think of hands towards heaven? Do you think of what do you think of? 
because you hear me say, I well, if people in my church hear me say all the time that I want you to worship in the way that the Lord is leading you to worship. And so if that means that you're going to kneel or if you're going to stand, you're going to have your arms raised, if you're going to be bouncing up and down, okay, like it doesn't, doesn't matter, okay? The posture isn't important. It's who you are worshiping, who you are focused on. And so we sometimes miss that, and we need to get back to that in our mindset. So in Chronicles 5.14, it says, And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Now, I, this is when I talk about like weird practices that you know some churches do. Um, there's one prominent church that you may be aware of what I'm about to say, um, but he talks about how they have a glory cloud, and you can even go on YouTube and you can like see people who are supposedly filming this glory cloud that's in the presence of their tabernacle. There's another church that has um, that you know they they claim that there's angel feathers that are falling from the rafters or you know gold dust, um, which miraculously, you know, is the same exact gold dust that they sell at Hobby Lobby. Um, but uh, all sorts of different things that some of these churches do to, you know, try and get people to believe that God's presence is there and he's moving and he's active. And so he's going to do some powerful things like, you know, heal people and, um, you know, like he, he's there to restore and heal and do all these ma miraculous things. And it's unnecessary because it's obviously contrived. I mean, I I really seriously doubt and from anything that I've seen, heard, anything like that, that these churches are really experiencing this Old Testament uh, picture of like the Shekinah glory of God in a cloud that's appearing in the middle of their worship services. You know, there there was another uh, lady that's prominent in the movement. She was talking about how like, you know, like cherubim were like, you know, up on stage and like, you know, Jesus even came into the church and he wanted to say something and all this kind of stuff. They, it's unnecessary because here's the bottom line presence. In the Old Testament, they had the physical presence of God that was with them. And then when Jesus came, you have the incarnation. So he's physically walking amongst them. But Jesus said, it's better for me to go away because then I can send the Holy Spirit to you and he will be in you. He won't be with you. He will be in you. He will literally empower you and it'll be me living my life out through you and everything that you do. And so we always have the presence of God here. But in terms of worship, how this applies is leaving room for the presence of God. You know, some churches get so caught up on tradition and um, that there's certain things that have to be done in certain ways and certain times. And even some churches who even say like when they're going to take communion that they say a blessing prayer over the, over the bread. And if if it's not said exactly the right way or they make a mistake or stumble, they have to start all the way over and have to go through all of those things. And that's just, that's just not, it's missing the point again. It's not about what you're doing. It's about who you are doing it for. But in reference to like this script in the church calendar and, you know, like certain elements that have to be present in every single worship service that, um, again, I feel like we're missing the point because sometimes we don't, we, we're so scripted in terms of our worship of God that we actually miss what God is actually doing in the midst of us, in, in, the, in the midst of a worship service. I personally love it when the Holy Spirit just totally takes everything that I have planned in a message and I, like a thought comes and I know it's not for me and I just take it and I run with it. And I, I love those moments. I, there's been moments where I've been up there teaching as a pastor and it literally feels like I'm watching myself preach. Um, those, those are awesome moments. I love it when, not just even in the preaching, but I love it when, you know, the person who's leading worship says, you know, 
we weren't supposed to do this song, but I really feel like we should sing this song. And let, so we're, can we do that right now? Or they just feel led to say something in the middle of worship. Uh, or even a person from the congregation, you know, like Apostle Paul talks about people who are given a word of knowledge or a word of prophecy, you know, or even in tongues um, when there's an interpreter there. And he says, let this, the prophets be subject to the prophets and let there be accountability and let there be order. But, you know, God can do something amazing in the midst of worship. And I love that. And uh, if, you, if you've been to my church, you know, we do uh, our worship service differently than a lot of churches do. And in fact, you know, that tomorrow morning or on Sunday morning, I should say, um, I'm going to be having communion at the very start of the service because of the very first point that we had in the message. Okay, and a lot of churches wouldn't even give room to do something like that. Doing something that's relevant to what is going on um, when it's relevant. And so you're actually like, you're living out and applying the story right there. You know, we sing songs, you know, that have to do with what we're talking about. We show video clips that have to do with what we're talking about and, you know, looking to implement, you know, different people's creative gifts in the midst of the service when it's relevant to what's going on in the text. You know, be that drama or art or, you know, testimony or all those types of things. And um, I love it because it's just leaving room for the presence of God to act and work in the midst of our worship and in the midst of our life. First Kings 8, 26, And now, God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David, my father, come true. And so this is Solomon uh, doing something that you see often in the pages of the scripture. They are reading scripture, and then they are reciting it back to God and saying, God, remember your promises, remember what you said, remember and, or even praying it into their life. So if you're reading about, you know, um, reading about prayer or reading about um, a certain character, fruit of the spirit, right? Love. Let's just take love. Okay. And you're reading about love and taking time and stopping and praying, God, you, we, I want to be more loving. I want to be more loving. And just taking whatever it is that you are reading about in God's word and a step in applying that is just expressing the desire to want to apply it or expressing the desire to have the desire. And I know that sounds a little bit weird, but sometimes the reason why we don't apply these things is because we honestly don't want to. <laughs> and... At least acknowledging that, confessing that, take responsibility for that. And taking responsibility for that as we pray. Okay, um, saying, God, I know that this is what your word says. And I know that I should want to do this. But I can honestly confess and say to you that I don't, or I struggle with it. And so, would you give me the desire to want to do this? Holy Spirit, would you stir up in me a desire to want to do this? And Or maybe you recognize that your motive when you do it is impure, that you're doing it for your own glory, that you're doing it for the pat on the back, you're doing it so that you look good. You'll do whatever reason it is. Um... And you say, God, I want to do this not for my own glory or for me to be built up. I want to do this for your glory. I want to do it because I love you. I want, and so it, that, so often our prayers are just centered around, you know, things that we need, things that we want. Um, and they're, they're good. God cares about those things. He wants us to pray for those things, but we oftentimes miss those elements of thanking God for who he is. And we miss those elements of like actually praying for the things that are probably most important to God's agenda in our life, which is like conforming us into his image for his glory. Okay. And so Solomon is praying, God, would you fulfill the promises that you made to my father? 
Would you fulfill your promises you gave us in your word, your scripture? Pray in the word of God. 1 Kings 8, 27, but will God really dwell on the earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. And again, you know, third day didn't write these lyrics. This is Solomon, okay? Um, but in the character of God, Solomon's about to open, inaugurate the temple. And as he's praying, he is aware of how absurd the idea is that like, oh, we built you a house, God. We built you a house for you to dwell in and for you to meet with us. And he's thinking, he's acknowledging, God, you're, you're everywhere. You are everywhere. You are, we call that omnipresent, which means that you are literally able to be everywhere at once. And, you know, David said it this way. He said, you know, if I go to the highest heaven, you are there. And if I go to the lowest depths, if I run, you know, to the depths of Sheol, you are there. Where can I hide from your presence and from your spirit? And so Solomon's saying, like, God, how marvelous is it that the God of the universe, the God who inhabits everything, who created the heavens and the earth, that you would honor us enough, that you would think highly enough of us and of our worship and our devotion to you, that you would make yourself present within this place. That there is a place that we physically can go to, that we can offer sacrifices, that we can meet with you, that we can pray to you, that we can get, get to know you and hear your word and, and sing your praises. How awesome is that? Now, we have to keep in mind that this is not something, like when we meet for church, for worship, we're not meeting in the house of God in the same way that... Um, the temple was literally the house of God, okay? <clears throat> you know, I say it all the time, you know, we, we learn as children that, you know, here's the church with the steeple and inside, let, open it up and here's the people, okay? And that's wrong, okay? It should say, here's the church who are the people <laughs> I'm trying to do this on the camera uh, inside the church with the pretty steeple okay because the reality is that when it talks about the household of God it's talking about people it's talking about us as the church people collectively who are called out of darkness into his marvelous light they are called into assembly together and that is what it means to be the church Okay, and so we don't have this same kind of thing. When it does talk about the temple of God in the New Testament, who is it talking about? It's talking about us individually, privately, but it also refers to the, the collective church as the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so it's both, <clears throat> both and. But even we, we would not be so arrogant as to say, well, if God indwells me, then he must not be indwelling you or he can't still be in heaven. You know, we, we know and acknowledge that God is everywhere. He is not contained by his creation. He can manifest himself within his creation in as many different ways as he wants to. You know, in the middle of worship service, he can be in the mid, in indwelling us. He can be inhabiting our praises, as he says in the in the Old Testament. Okay, he can <clears throat> be where two or three are gathered in the midst. Of, I will be in there in the midst of you. Okay, he can, at the same time, be manifesting himself in a miracle. You know, that's being done, and if he wanted to, then he could physically, you know, appear in the midst of us if he wanted to. But most of the time, let's just acknowledge it, most of the time, that's not how he does it anymore because he indwells us. He doesn't need to do all of these powerful things. We don't need a priest. We don't need a prophet. We don't need a temple anymore. Because we have direct access 24-7 to come boldly before the throne of grace. 1 Kings 8.33 When your people Israel are struck down before the enemy because they have sinned against you, when heaven is shut up and there is no rain, 
because they have sinned against you and shall turn again to you and confess your name and pray and make supplication unto you in this house. And it goes on with a number of different scenarios. In his prayer, he's continuing on and he's, he's saying, God, we're not perfect. We know that we're sinners. And so we're asking, Father, that, that when there's times when we have sinned individually or collectively as a people, and even we continue to do it in spite of the fact that you have prophets that come and teach us and call us back to you, in spite of the fact, you know, of all of the miracles that you do in our midst, in spite of all of that, when we continue to rebel against you uh, collectively as a people, and you've gotten to the point where you're going to pour out your wrath on us, Lord, let it be that this can be a place that no matter where we are, even if we're physically not even here in Jerusalem anymore, no matter where we are in Israel or in Babylon or Assyria, that this be the place that we turn towards and we call out your name and we repent. And Lord, would this be the place where your where your forgiveness, where your grace can be poured out on us, where forgiveness can be can, can be manifested, and for restoration to begin to happen, that you call us back to this place, that you call us back into your presence, that you call us back as your people. Solomon is saying something very profound here. He's not just saying that God is the God of grace, but he is God of grace who can forgive the future. He's praying for something that hasn't even happened yet. He's praying for something that God has said, you know, like back in Deuteronomy, like, hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to give you all these rules and you're going to break them and you're going to buy and you're going to go to a place where you're going to be the stranger and it's going to be a timeout, but I'm not going to give up on you. And he says it through Deuteronomy and the law. He says it through all the prophets and which we haven't gotten to yet but Solomon realizes he's a God who's not just present everywhere but he's a God who forgives the future he's able to forgive the future you know sometimes we have the impression that like when we come to Jesus we repent of all our sins and we come to him and it's like oh I better not mess up now because you know Jesus forgave all my sins up until this point or like maybe when when we got baptized, like we literally, he washed away all our sins, right? And we have this picture like, okay, well, he gave, forgave me everything up until now, but now I better confess my sins when I give, when I do them because if I don't, then what if I, you know, what if I sin and then I get into an accident and I die and what's going to happen to me? We don't need to worry about stuff like that because Jesus, he didn't just die for the sins up until the point in which he died. He forgave all of the sins. It was an eternal sacrifice. In eternity isn't having a lot of time. It's, it's where past, present, and future are all happening out at once simultaneously. And it was the eternal sacrifice. So he was able to erase the sins of the past, erase the sins of the present, and erase the sins of the future all at once. When you pray and ask forgiveness and you accept the grace of God and the gospel that Jesus died for your sins and he rose again from the dead, when you accept that as his child, then you are forgiven from now on for all time and eternity. You are forgiven. And you have a clean slate. You are a new creation. The old one has passed away. You have the mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ. You have um, the heart of Christ, right? Okay, new heart, new spirit, new mind. You are a new creation. You have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You have been forgiven as far as the east is from the west. That's the God that we worship. And, you know, if you'd like to know more about that, you have questions about that, if you if something's keeping you from, you know, accepting that message of grace, then please comment in that or message me directly. Um, I would love to help you through that process. Okay? And if you, if you pray and you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, I would love to hear about it. 
So please let me know. So for if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, let me just ask you this. How is God calling you to grow? In the terms of in reference to worship, is he calling you to be present? Is he calling you to focus on Jesus? Is he allowing is it allowing the Holy Spirit to lead in your life? Is it your prayer life? Is it knowing God? Is it embracing the message of grace? I would love to hear how God's moving and acting in your life. And I just want to remind you of our three-step process. Check out the description down below for this week's assignments, daily assignments to get you in the Word of God. And check out next week's video as we go over those passages. And I share my comments just like I did here. And uh, I would love to hear your insights, your comments, your questions down below. I'll be checking back to see what you all have to say. And until next time, may God's grace be with you.